Ray, can you hear us? Yes, indeed. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. My name is Ken Hudson and welcome to the Australian um, 2005 uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Summit. And from Australia, g'day. Well, good morning from Atlanta. <laughs> I am uh, very glad to be with you through the magic of video conferencing. I understand this is a high-powered group and I appreciate your being here and inviting me to be with you. I know my accent is strange to you, so while you tune your ears to my way of talking, let me introduce myself in my own way. I am first an industrialist. Some would say a radical industrialist, but as competitive as anyone you know, and as profit-minded as anyone you know, I founded Underface my company from absolute scratch from just an idea 32 years ago, and through the efforts of many wonderful people, it's grown into a billion dollar global manufacturer, producing carpets and carpet tiles, textiles, architectural flooring, primarily for commercial and institutional buildings, but also now for the home, with manufacturing on four continents and sales in 110 countries. You would have to say it's successful by any standard definition of success. I trust you'll be familiar already with the story of Interface's commitment to achieving environmental sustainability. I want to tell you it's real. And my assignment today is make the case for why and to talk about how. To give you a progress report that I hope you will find encouraging. And I also want to spend a, a minute defining the role of higher education in societal transformation because I understand there are students and teachers in your conference. So let me approach this in terms of three trends. First, I presume we all know there's a problem. The industrial system of which we're all a part is consuming the earth, and it is destroying the biosphere. And though it's a very, very long-term trend, you might say it's a very bad trend. I'll talk a little bit later about how this is happening. There's another trend, it's a good trend, a growing sense of awareness and a developing sense of right and wrong with respect to that first trend. You could call it environmental ethics. Religious conservatives prefer to call it creation care. People are just becoming more and more aware that we are pushing nature too far. You read about it in the newspaper every day, and people are reacting with growing concern. Where these two trends, declining biosphere, increasing awareness, intersect, is where the fate of humankind will be decided. What we need at that intersection is a plan, and that is the meat of my presentation this morning. But first, the why. I gather you don't need to be convinced that we are in the process of seriously degrading the biosphere that supports all of life on Earth, us plus some 30 million, some think as many as 100 million other species that share the planet with us. If this trend goes unchecked, we will lose the biosphere. Perhaps it would be instructive to consider just how a living planet, a living planet, the rarest, the most precious thing in the known universe, could lose its biosphere, its essential livability. We really don't want to believe it could happen, or even want to think about it. But you and I are required to be thinkers. And if we do think about it, we know that if the day came in the distant future when Earth had lost its livability, it would have happened insidiously, one silted a polluted stream at a time, one polluted river at a time, one collapsing fish stock, one dying coral reef at a time, one acidified or eutrophied lake at a time, one over-fertilized farm at a time, leading to one algae bloom at a time, one eroded ton of topsoil, one developed wetland at a time, one disrupted animal migration corridor at a time, one corrupt politician at a time, one new open pit coal mine in a pristine valley at a time, one decimated old growth forest, one lost habitat, at a time, one disappearing acre of rainforest, one leaching landfill, at a time, one belching smokestack or exhaust pipe, at a time, one depleted or polluted aquifer, at a time, one desertified farm, one overgrazed field, at a time, one toxic release, one oil spill, one breath of fouled air, at a time, 
one unremediated brownfield at a time, one political payoff at a time resulting in one regulatory rollback at a time, one tenth of a degree of global warming at a time, one manipulated river channel at a time, one exotic disease vector, one new disease, one invasive species at a time, one perchlorate contaminated head of lettuce at a time. Perchlorate is rocket fuel and it's in the groundwater of our San Joaquin Valley of California thanks to an industrial neighbor. One chlorofluorinated or methyl brominated molecule of ozone at a time, destroying the ozone ultraviolet radiation shield, something very dear to all of creation, since everything dies without it. One poorly designed carpet at a time, one thoughtlessly designed building, a building interior at a time, one obsolete college curriculum at a time, teaching the present system of destruction and teaching the teachers to perpetuate it for the, another generation or two. One misplaced kilogram of plutonium at a time. One more ton of nuclear fuel waste at a time looking for a safe and secure home for 240,000 years. One advance of urban sprawl at a time. One insensitive uninformed architect or interior designer or factory manager or manufacturer at a time. One songbird at a time. One PCB-laced orca, one whale, one dolphin, one trumpeter swan, one mountain gorilla, one polar bear, one leatherback turtle at a time. One entire wild species at a time. And one poverty-stricken, starving, diseased, or exploited human being at a time. That's how it would have happened. And when we make ourselves stop and think, we know that's how it is happening. You could make your own list just as long without a single duplication. It is a long, 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 slippery slope, and we're on it. We're losing the biosphere itself, one strand of the web of life at a time. It is true, it is manifestly wrong, and it will not stop until either we homo sapiens come to our senses or we too are gone and can do no more damage. If we do come to our senses in time, that will happen one changed mind at a time, out of a growing sense of right and wrong, environmental ethics undergirded by enlightened self-interest. All that said, I confess that I'm a relative newcomer to this mind change, this new view of reality, proof perhaps it's never too late. Eleven years ago at age 60, I read Paul Hawkins' book, The Ecology of Commerce. It changed my life. It changed my view of the world. It came for me at a propitious moment. Our customers, especially interior designers, had begun to ask, what's Interface doing for the environment? So I had agreed reluctantly to speak to a newly assembled environmental task force of Interface people from around the world to address this awkward question. Awkward for me because I could not get beyond we obey the law, comply. Hawkins' book changed that. It landed on my desk at that propitious moment by pure serendipity. Without any idea what was in it, I started to thumb it. On page 19, I came to an arresting chapter heading, The Death of Birth. The Death of Birth. I began to read. On page 25, I found the full meaning of the chapter heading, and, and I encountered four terms I had never before heard mentioned together in one paragraph. Carrying capacity, overshoot, collapse, and extinction. That is the death of birth, species disappearing never ever to be born again. I read, quote, a haunting and off-sighted case of overshoot took place on St. Matthew Island in the Bering Sea in 1944 when 29 reindeer were imported. Specialists had calculated that the island could support 13 to 18 reindeer per square mile, a total population between 1,600 and 2,300 animals. By 1957, 13 years, the population was 1,350. But by 1963, just six more years with no natural control for predators, the population had exploded to 6,000. The scientists double-checked. The original calculations had been correct, and this number vastly exceeded carrying capacity. And sure enough, 
the population was soon decimated by disease and starvation. Such a drastic overshoot, however, did not lead to restabilization at a lower level with just the extra reindeer dying off. Instead, the entire habitat was so damaged by the overshoot that the number of reindeer fell drastically below the original carrying capacity. And by 1966, just three years, there were only 42 reindeer alive on St. Matthew Island. The difference between ruminants and ourselves is that the resources used by the reindeer were grasses, trees, and shrubs, and they eventually return, whereas many of the resources we're exploiting will not." End quote. Reading this for the first time 11 years ago, I knew in my heart and in my mind that it was a metaphor for Earth and humankind. It was an epiphanal moment, a spear in the chest for me. I knew, too, that it was more than a metaphor. It demonstrated the law of nature as immutable and as sure as the law of gravity, the cause and effect relationship between humankind, between overshoot and collapse. Sidebar, as we speak, humankind is in overshoot, using at least 120% of the planet's carrying capacity, very probably much more, abusing the web of life one strand at a time. And this is according to the Global Footprint Network, sponsored by World Wildlife Fund. I read on, and I was dumbfounded by how much I did not know about the environment and the impacts of the industrial system on the environment, the industrial system of which I and my successful company were an integral part. A new definition of success flooded my consciousness and a latent lurking sense of legacy asserted itself. I got it. I was a plunderer of earth, stealing my grandchildren's future. And that is not the legacy one wants to leave behind. I wept. Hawking made the central point of his book in three parts. One, the living systems, the life support systems of earth are in decline. We are degrading the biosphere. It is a developing global crisis. Two, the biggest culprit in this decline is the industrial system. The linear take, make, waste, fossil fuel driven, wasteful, abusive system of which we are each and every one a part. And three, the only institution on earth that is large enough, powerful enough, pervasive enough, wealthy enough, influential enough to lead humankind out of the mess it is making for itself is the same one that's doing the greatest damage. The institution of business and industry, my institution, for many of you, your institution, the institution for which you in education are preparing tomorrow's members. I took that message to heart. I made that speech and I committed my company to the road to sustainability, which today I consider to be its ultimate purpose. I simply said to my people on August 31, 1994, if Hawking is right and business and industry must lead, who will lead business and industry? Unless somebody leads, Nobody will. Why not us? Since then, I have been a recovering plunderer. I've told that story in much greater detail in my own book, Mid-Course Correction, published in 1998. Its title is intended to connote my company's mid-course correction, my personal mid-course correction, and the one that I would wish for humankind. So what about a plan? How are we, one petro-intensive company, approaching the transformation of our company? How are we climbing Mount Sustainability? I can tell you the first decision was mine to determine that we are going to climb it. And even when some people thought I'd gone round the bend to stay on the message consistently, persistently, year after year, and to put the right people in the roles and empower them to make it happen. But the most important decision was made collectively by the people of Interface, one mind at a time, to embrace this challenging vision. We began where we were in 1994 with a schematic showing all the connections or linkages between Interface and the Earth, directly and through our people, our suppliers, our customers, and communities. We ask ourselves, what's wrong with this picture? We ask this when very few, if any, companies anywhere we're asking it of themselves. 
And out of that analysis came a plan in terms of climbing the seven faces of Mount Sustainability to meet at the top, that point at the summit symbolizing zero impact, zero footprint. This plan is the heart of mid-course correction. I'll quickly sketch it for you because I believe it offers a template for the entire industrial system. Here are the seven faces of the mountain. The first face is waste elimination through Quest. That stands for quality utilizing employee suggestions and teamwork. We want to emulate nature in our industrial processes. In nature, there is no waste. One organism's waste is another's food. This has meant revolutionary redesign and re-engineering of process, severing the unwanted linkages to Earth represented by our waste streams. We started here and we've made money every step of the way, $289 million cumulatively for the last, over the last 10 and three quarter years. The second phase, benign emissions, to, no, to do no further harm to the biosphere. This means reshaping inputs to our factories, working upstream. What comes in will go out as product or waste or effluence or emissions. We want to eliminate smokestacks and obviate effluent pipes. And for sure, we want to eliminate our net contribution to global warming worldwide. The third phase is renewable energy, focusing on, focusing on energy efficiency first, and then harnessing sunlight, wind, biomass, and someday hydrogen to cut the fossil fuel umbilical cord to Earth, and filling the carbon gap with greenhouse gas offsets. The fourth phase is closed loop material flows to cut the material umbilical cord to Earth for virgin fossil derived materials. The technologies did not begin when we started, but one by one they fall into place, including beginning the shift to carbohydrate polymers to replace petro derived hydrocarbon polymers using corn dextrose as a feedstock to replace fossil fuel feedstocks. The fifth phase is resource efficient transportation to achieve carbon neutrality in our transportation systems by eliminating or offsetting greenhouse gases generated in moving people and products. The sixth phase is the sensitivity hookup. This is the culture shift, the mindset shift, to sensitize and educate everyone, customers, suppliers, employees, and communities, to inspire environmentally responsible actions, the thousands and thousands of little things that everyone can do, to begin to move towards sustainability, and to connect in a more meaningful way with our stakeholders, especially with communities on educational initiatives. The seventh face of the mountain, when all the rest is this is in place, and it certainly depends on getting the other six right, we hope then to pioneer the true service economy that goes beyond people selling their service, that's accountants and lawyers and teachers and waiters and so forth, to selling the service that products provide instead of the products themselves. In the case of carpets, this means color, texture, design, acoustics, comfort underfoot, cleanliness, ambiance, functionality, the service rather than the product, and retaining ownership in the stuff, the means of delivery, and giving those products that stuff life after life in closed loop material flows, which will bring about manifold improvement in resource efficiency by using stuff over and over. Success on all seven fronts. The successful climb of all seven faces brings us to the summit and our goal, the prototypical company of the 21st century, modeled after nature. Here's what it looks like. If I can put this picture into words, it will be strongly service oriented by means of products that deliver service, even as nature delivers services. It will be resource efficient, wasting nothing. Cyclical, no more linear take, make, waste processes of the first industrial revolution. Driven by renewable energy, minimized and afforded by means of efficiency. Strongly connected to all constituencies, communities engaged, customers engaged, suppliers buying into the vision. And connected to each other within the organization. An ecosystem with cooperation replacing confrontation. That includes Earth in win-win-win relationships and way ahead of any regulatory process, rendering the regulatory process essentially irrelevant, taking nothing from Earth's crust that's not rapidly renewable and doing no harm to her biosphere. 
All the undesirable linkage is gone, new vital linkage is in place, sustainable and just, an example for all, and doing well, very well, by doing good. Winning in the marketplace, but not at Earth's expense, and not at the expense of our descendants, but at the expense of the inefficient adapter, the competitor who just doesn't get it. And growing, yes, even in a no-growth world, should we come to that by increasing value at the expense of the inefficient. And with declining throughput of virgin materials eventually to zero, only zero throughput of extracted natural capital is sustainable over evolutionary time, the true long run. Our goal is to achieve this zero footprint, this zero impact by the year 2020. Doing well by doing good, cause and effect, effect and cause all rolled into one positive feedback loop that is good for Earth. And that is how the triple bottom line of corporate social responsibility done right will come together in one truly superior financial bottom line. And companies everywhere will want to emulate the example. And that is how an entire industrial system can move toward sustainability. So how are we doing on the environmental front? It's a work in process. Here are a few metrics comparing where we are, where we are today with where we started in 1994. Roger, if you can move on to the next. Waste $281 million of cost avoidance over 10 and 3 quarter years, paying for all the rest of this mountain climb. Greenhouse gas emissions down 52% in absolute tonnage. Two thirds of that's from efficiencies and renewables, one third from offsets. Non renewable fossil derived energy used in our worldwide carpet, carpet operations down 43% relative production. 11% of the current energy usage comes from renewable sources. The goal remains 100% renewable. Water usage down 66% relative to production. And you can see the corresponding figures for our Picton Australia operation. Smokestacks, we've closed 40% now. They've been obviated by process changes. Effluent pipes, 53% abandoned obviated by process change, changes. Trees for travel, more than 52,000 trees planted, offsetting some 78 plus million passenger miles in commercial airliners. Scrap to the landfill down more than 80%. And 81 million pounds of material diverted from landfills and incinerators by reentry, our initiative, initiative to reclaim and recycle used products. Precious organic molecules salvaged to be given life after life. We hope someday to mine the landfills for our petrochemical feedstocks. Our customers can now buy climate neutral carpet, meaning no net contribution to global warming throughout the life cycle. Third party verified. We call it cool carpet. This reduced footprint is reflected in every product we make anywhere in the world, and some more than others to be sure. But not just one product here and one there. We're greening in an entire company and its supply chain. We simply do not believe you can make green products in a brown company. Furthermore, we know that we are our entire supply chain, as is any other company or organization. No one stands alone. But you may ask how you're doing on the economic front. And this could surprise you for this entire initiative has been incredibly good for business. It is a better way to bigger profits. It is a new industrial model. First, our costs are down, not up, dispelling the myth that sustainability is costly. Those waste savings alone have more than paid the way. Second, our products are the best they've ever been since our product designers found the inspiration of biomimicry. That's Janine Binius's book published in 1997, Nature as Teacher, Nature as Inspiration. Our lead product designer sent his team into the forest to discover nature's design principles. He asked how would nature design a carpet, a floor covering, and they studied the forest floor, the stream beds, and they realized that there was total diversity, even chaos. No two things were alike. No two sticks, no two stones, no two leaves, no two limbs, nothing. Yet there was a very pleasant orderliness in this chaos. 
So the designers went back to the design studio. They designed a carpet tile such that the face design of no two tiles were identical. Everyone was different. Contrary to the prevailing industrial paradigm, our predilection with perfection, that every mass-produced item must be cookie-cutter the same. We introduced this new product with the name Entropy. Yeah, that's right. It means disorder. And in a year and a half, it moved to the top of the bestseller list faster than any other product ever has. The advantages of breaking the old paradigm, our insistence on perfection and sameness, were surprisingly numerous. There was almost no waste and no off quality in production. Inspectors could not find defects among the deliberate imperfection of no two tiles alike. The installer could install tiles very quickly without having to take the traditional care to get the nap running uniformly. The less uniform the installation, the better. So we could just take tiles out of the box and put them down the way they came, out of the box, laying them randomly. There was almost no scrap during installation. Every piece, even piece tiles, could find a place to be used. And then the user could replace an individual damaged tile without creating the sore thumb effect of a new tile. That so typically goes with precision perfection. Furthermore, there were no longer issues of dye lots. Dye lots merged indistinguishably. This obviated the need for shelf stock, the extra tiles on the shelf of the original dye lot. And the user could even rotate the tiles on the floor to equalize wear, the way tires can be rotated on a car. And even with all, these unex all of these unexpected benefits, I wondered if there was not still more to explain the success of entropy. And then I heard a speaker on the environmental circuit that began every speech by having her audience close their eyes. We might try it with you. Close your eyes and imagine that perfect ideal place of peace and serenity, creativity, comfort, security, that place you would go to be creative, to be totally secure and comfortable. Now, how many of you were somewhere indoors. Almost no one ever raises a hand. We humans gravitate to nature for that ideal comfort zone. And somehow I believe that entropy brings outdoors indoors in a subliminal way, and that is its real appeal. There is enormous power in biomimicry because of biophilia, our human, our human comfort with nature. Today, there's a family of more than 30 interface carpet tile products designed on the principle, no two alike. Third, our people are galvanized around this higher purpose of sustainability, confirming psychologist Abraham Maslow's assertion years ago that at the top of the pyramid of human needs is self-actualization, which translates into higher purpose. You cannot beat it for bringing people together, and it happened one mind at a time. Finally, the goodwill of the marketplace has been nothing less than astounding. No amount of advertising could have created as much or meant as much to the top line to creating a predisposition toward interface and to winning business in the marketplace. These four advantages have enabled interface to survive the deepest, most protracted recession in our industry's history. You're looking at the graph of office furniture sales, that is our primary marketplace around the world, which declined 38% from peak to trough over a two and a half year period. We might not have made it through this downturn without those sustainability advantages. You can see a lot more if you visit interfacesustainability.com. Take a look. You will find total transparency. Our first sustainability report in 1997 contained 19 printed pages. Today, there are more than 400 pages online for real-time update. As for other companies and industries, I see no other choice for the entire industrial system if it is to survive. Not just our industry, all industry has got to make this transition, undergo this transformation to survive those who don't want. What we hope to demonstrate at Interface is that it can be done, therefore it must be possible to be the first, but not the last. We hope to facilitate this growing sense of ethical awareness that will move humankind towards survival 
rather than extinction, and encouraged the market to demand ethical production of its products and its built environment. This is where you come in. We must and we will all together learn to make peace with Earth rather than war and teach peacemaking in our universities. There's a third trend growing out of the first two, the decline of the biosphere, the rise of ethics. It is the means by which an ethically enlightened species will address the slippery slope. And it is the trend in technology, which is not so well established yet. Without a doubt today, <clears throat> technology is part of the problem. Standing alongside population and affluence in the environmental impact equation, Roger, I equal P times A times T. I for impact is a negative thing, a bad thing, the bigger the worse. I is the product of P for population, the bigger the worse. A for affluence, the greater the worse. And T for technology, the more the worse. So environmental impact comes from people, the stuff they consume, and how it is made. Technology is part of the problem. So technology is in the numerator of the equation, I equal P times A times T. Next. Well, just how are the characteristics, what are the characteristics of technology that put it in the numerator where its effect is destructive? I suggest that these characteristics are extractive they take natural capital from Earth. They are linear, take, make, waste, throughput. Did you know that only 3% of the throughput of the entire system has any value whatsoever six months after its extraction from the Earth? They are fossil fuel driven for energy, wasteful, abusive, and focused on increasing labor productivity, more everything per man hour. For technologies with those characteristics, absolutely, the more the worse. They belong in the numerator because they are consuming the earth. On the other hand, might it be possible to make technology part of the solution? That's the challenge of our times and the next generation and the next. How do you move technology, T, from the numerator, where the more the worse, to the denominator, where the more the better, where it can reduce impact? How do we move technology to the denominator? I suggest this can happen when technology is renewable rather than extractive. For example, cutting the oil umbilical cord to earth. When it is cyclical, not linear, and material flows are in closed loops, cutting the virgin material umbilical cord to earth. When it's solar, biomass, and hydrogen driven, not fossil fuel driven. When it's waste free and benign rather than wasteful and abusive. And when it is focused on resource productivity, the productivity of all resources, not just labor productivity. <clears throat> this trend has begun haltingly, but it's only in its early stage with renewable energy technologies, with recycling technologies, with clean, lean manufacturing technologies, with hybrid gas electric propulsion. It must continue much more deliberately and much more quickly to put T in the denominator. This is the third trend, the one that makes technology part of the solution. This is the biggest remaining challenge that we have at Interface in reaching the top of Mount Sustainability. Which brings us back to our universities where I suspect some of you have influence and the role that they must play. Will they continue to be part of the problem or part of the solution? Where will they stand in the years ahead with respect to the nexus of these three trends? Will our mechanical engineers learn about internal combustion engines or will they study fuel cells? Will our electrical engineers continue to learn about coal-powered central generating stations, or will they study wind and photovoltaic and biomass distributed generation? Will our ceramics engineers learn the traditional abusive heat beat treat methods, or will they study the abalone's natural nanotechnological method, as it makes better ceramics than any man-made ceramic and does it out of readily abundant minerals in seawater at 40 degrees Fahrenheit? Will our textile engineers continue to learn to make Kevlar with boiling sulfuric acid, thank you very much, or study the spider as it makes a better, five times stronger, more resilient textile fiber out of bugs at body temperature? Will our chemistry students learn to make the next PCB, or will they learn green enzymatic chemistry in water? 
Will our economic students be taught that the externalities, the cost to society and the environment don't count in the economic system? And that perverse subsidies are somehow good and somehow deserved? Or will they learn about true full cost accounting that would put the cost of barrel of oil at fully $200 a barrel if the cost of wars in the Middle East were included? Or if the cost of global warming to future generations were charged today to the burning of that oil? Will our designers be taught that good design is when there's nothing else to add? Or good design is when there's nothing else to remove? Will our law students be taught that compliance and defending their clients' bad behavior is their job? Or will they be urged to go beyond compliance and insist that their clients, that their clients embrace ethical behavior? Furthermore, will our teachers be taught the present outmoded destructive system so they can pass it on and perpetuate destruction for another generation or two or three? Or will our universities wake up to their responsibility to challenge the obsolete status quo in their curricula? Will curricula continue to be locked in the past and more of the destructive same or focused on a sustainable future? A sustainable society into the indefinite future arising from the nexus of these three trends depends totally and absolutely on a vast redesign of the system triggered by an equally vast mind shift, one mind at a time, one organization at a time, one technology at a time, one building, one company, one university curriculum, one community, one region, one industry at a time, until the entire system of which we're all a part has been transformed into a sustainable system existing ethically in balance with Earth's natural systems upon which every living thing utterly depends, even civilization itself. And all of us must be part of this. I've been quite taken by Jared Diamond's compellingly written book, Collapse, his most recent publication. His central thesis is that cultural survival and biological survival are two different things. And civilizations can collapse biologically even as their cultures thrive, but ignore the limits of biological and ecological reality which surround them, that is to say, carrying capacity. There's that term again. It seems to me that culture, with all of its taboos and mores, is a reflection of a society's mindset. So what about the mindset that underlies our culture? What is society's general view of reality, our prevailing paradigm? I strongly suggest that we're in the grips of a flawed view of reality, a flawed paradigm, a flawed worldview, and it pervades our culture, putting us on Jared Diamond's biological collision course with reality. It is the paradigm that is reflected in our culture's infatuation with stuff otherwise known as consumerism. The truth of a new paradigm doesn't just spring into existence. It will have been there all along. It will just have been obscured by the old flawed view of reality. The earth was always round, even when everyone knew it was flat. It always circled the sun, even when everyone knew it was the sun of the universe. As Amor Levin says, the best way to have new, better ideas is just to stop having the old, bad ideas. That old flawed view of reality, in this case, is the one that treats Earth as if it were infinite in its ability to supply the stuff to feed the industrial system's metabolism. When clearly, for one example, oil's coming peak sooner or later but surely reminds us vividly that Earth is finite, or as if Earth were an infinite sink into which to pour our poisonous waste. That old flawed view of reality is the one that adopts as its relevant time frame for caring about the consequences of our decision, the life of a human being, more likely the working life, rather than recognizing the true long-term evolutionary time. I think we would settle for the indigenous people's standard of seven generations here. That holds on to the notion that Earth was made for humankind to conquer, to rule, to take whatever we want from nature without regard for the other species that depend on even comprised nature. Nature of which we too are a part, not separate. What we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. 
That old flawed view of reality holds that technology coupled with left brain human intelligence will see us through without addressing the extractive, abusive attributes of technology that are part of the problem, and without appreciating the right brain attributes of intelligence that include the human spirit. Here I would add a fourth trend and say that the ascendancy of women in business, the professions, and government and education is one of the most encouraging of all trends. As women bring their right brain nurturing nature to bear on the seemingly intractable challenges created by left-brain men and our preoccupation with bottom lines and other practical considerations. After all, it's a practical and pragmatic that got us into this mess. Surely a different kind of thinking is needed to get us out. As the French philosopher Sartre said, all the facts in the world would not get us to the essence of any issue. That old flawed view of reality holds that the invisible hand of the market is an honest broker. When we know the market can be very dishonest because it's blind to the externalities as it establishes prices. Does the price of a pack of cigarettes established by the market in its revered wisdom reflect its true cost? Not close. The price of a barrel of oil? Not within $150 a barrel. The invisible hand is blind as a bat if prices are dishonest. What kind of broker can it be stumbling along in its blindness? The old flawed view of reality holds that increasing labor productivity is the route to abundance for all. When it is clear in a world of diminishing nature and increasing population that the route to abundance for all is through increasing resource productivity. For example, using those precious organic petrochemical molecules over and over and over. That's the logic behind, behind all recycling efforts. Even inorganic materials have embodied energy that can be salvaged and putting people to work in the process. The old flawed view of reality holds that happiness is to be found in abundance and material wealth, the trappings of affluence, when we know that there's more to happiness than more stuff, and that consumerism will not bring real happiness, despite the messages with which our children and we are bombarded to saturation through advertising. The old flawed view of reality, the old flawed view of reality holds to the belief that business exists to make a profit. When we know from our own experience in this new paradigm that business makes a profit to exist, and it must surely exist for some higher purpose, what CEO do you know who really expects to stand before her or his maker someday and talk about shareholder value? The old flawed view of reality holds that the environment is a subset of the economy, you know, the pollution part. In our new enlightenment, we know that the economy is the wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. To quote the late, <coughs> the late United States Senator Gaylord Nelson, <coughs> the environment is the parent. The economy is the child. It is not the other way around, which most of our economists still seem to believe. Will we shift paradigms in time and truly embrace a new view of reality? That's the question of our era. And the hell of it is, and this is the hard part, it's up to you and me. For me, the last 11 years have brought near total immersion in this new paradigm, this new worldview, certainly far different from my parents and very different from my own up until that day 11 years ago. The essence of everything I've learned in these 11 years can be summed up in the lessons of a recent experience, a metaphorical experience, if you will, that I'd like to share with you in closing. For all of us in the southern United States, the environmental elephant in the room has been Hurricane Katrina, then Rita and Wilma, and they've demanded our attention. The week following Katrina, my wife, Pat, and I were on vacation in Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, eastern Canada. One morning, I drove our rented car to a trailhead, and I took a walk up a mountain trail. I was alone on the trail, and as, ne as I neared the top of the mountain, huffing and puffing along, I looked up, whoa, hello. There on the trail ahead, about 60 feet away, stood a bull moose. He was standing crossways, 
Black in the trail, enormous, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall, rack and all, and he was looking at me. I actually considered for a moment clapping my hands to shoo him away. Then I caught myself and I thought, don't be stupid. This is his trail. I'm the intruder. If he charges, I don't stand a chance. So I backed off and I turned and I retreated back down the mountain, keeping a watchful eye on the trail behind me. <clears throat> My heart was pounding. It was an amazing experience. I had been face to face with the force of nature. Well, Pat and I were glued to the television the entire week, watching CNN, keeping up with the unfolding aftermath of Katrina. After meeting the moose, I could not miss the metaphor. The trail was the moose's territory. I was the intruder. How human-like of me to want to shoo him away, claim the trail for myself, and how foolish. Had I challenged him, it would have been at my own peril. If he charges, I am mincemeat. Do you see the metaphor? The atmosphere is nature's trail. We, as are the meandering riverbeds and the buffer wetlands and the deltas and the barrier islands, we challenge nature on her trail with our greenhouse gases, our man-made river channels, our chopped up wetlands at our own peril. On August 29, 2005, nature charged from the Gulf of Mexico. And Louisiana and Mississippi, an area the size of England, are mincemeat. I doubt if there are many scientists who would say yet that Katrina, Rita, or Wilma were caused by global warming. But I think there are very few who would say they were not exacerbated by global warming. All went from a Category 1 to Category 4, Category 5 for a while. In two or three days, Wilma in one day because of the abnormally warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. So just why were the Gulf waters abnormally warm? The precautionary principle says we must not assume happenstance. We must ask, what is going on? And I think that there are very few scientists who would not agree that hurricanes and floods and storms and droughts will become more frequent and more fierce, and the weather more erratic as the atmosphere and oceans become warmer still in the years ahead. As long as we continue to intrude on nature's trail, challenge her in her domain, thinking we can shoo her away and claim it for ourselves, we do so at our own peril, and we can expect her to, challenge, to charge again and again. Her trail is simply not ours to do with as we please. One mind at a time, humankind will realize that. To you in education, your business is shaping minds, including the minds that will guide business and industry, not to mention governments and the critical turnaround years that lie ahead. You in business, your business is thinking and acting responsibly. Who will lead? Unless somebody does, nobody will. Why not you? Thank you for taking on that challenge. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Ray, thank you for that um, thought-provoking, challenging, um, and uh, wonderful case study of uh, CSR absolutely in action. Um, I'd invite people um, for questions for uh, Ray, and uh, I think we have a mic for people, so um, perhaps if they could, uh, the people come round. Hello, good day, Ray. It's a great uh, pleasure to be in the same room as yourself with the Pacific Ocean in the middle. Can you hear Ray? Are there? Yes, yes, I can, thank uh, you. Okay. Now, Ray, um, I'm very much involved in sustainability culture shift and mind shift and education, and it'd be, be wonderful to hear from you if you could comment on the relationship or the importance of the sensitivity hookup um, on the other six faces of Mount Sustainability. Oh, wonderful question. It would not happen without the six face. In many ways, it's the single most important. We just simply cannot do this without our suppliers, and we cannot do it without our customers' support. And we surely cannot do it without the involvement and commitment of our people, and even the communities which are supplying our people. 
So it's by far the most important, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's the one that's, that's basically prerequisite, really, to the other six faces. Thank you for that question. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. Can't hear. Nope, not yet. Sorry, Ray. We'll Sorry. just look. Whoa. Oh, there you are. There, there you we are. are. Okay, we're on now. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> Thanks again for a, uh, a wonderful uh, dissertation. I just have a specific, perhaps uh, prosaic question. In your experience with the financial sector, the bankers, the bourse, the insurance uh, sector, uh, I'm wondering uh, what sort of experiences you've had and what lessons we could draw from that as to what role they might play in the uh, vision you're putting before us. Right. When we began 11 years ago, the only part of this that we truly shared with the financial community was the quest part, the waste elimination, and they loved it. And in fact, we had very little to report on the other six faces, or the other six fronts, until probably six or seven years into the journey. And by then, we got, we got up the courage, you might say, to share what we were doing with the financial community and our annual report to shareholders for the year 2001 had the caption, A Better Way to Bigger Profits. And we began to speak more openly and write more openly about what we were doing on all the rest of this. And there was skepticism, but that was not like outright revolt, anything like that. But there was skepticism. And then two of, our, two of the financial analysts that follow our company came to our annual big uh, show uh, called Neocon, held in Chicago each year. It's the interior furnishings uh, show of the year, where everybody displays products. And that year, every single product that we introduced had some aspect of sustainability that was uh, included, incorporated into the product. It might be a little bit of recycled content here or renewable energy there, but some aspect of sustainability. And these two analysts came to our showroom and we told them the whole story. They went away without comment. Two days later, they came back and independently, they each said, we have been all through, I've been all through this marketplace and sustainability is everywhere. And I see that you guys are leading this and it's changing the marketplace. And I now understand you found a better way. And from that moment, it was like a watershed event. We've never had rejection by the financial community for what we're doing. In, a, in, in an era today of $60 oil, the fact that you're using 43% fossil-derived energy in your carpet operation plays very, very well, uh, even with Wall Street and the toughest-minded you know, financier there is. So we, we got through that hurdle basically by being quiet until we had something to really report. Okay, next question, perhaps up the back here. Yeah. Ray, thanks very much for your talk, uh, Ian Dunlop. Um, one of the biggest problems, I think, in changing the current paradigm is the sort of elaborate edifice of short-term incentives that we've built up right through the system, starting in the financial community and flowing on right into the corporate arena in a broader sense. What has happened in that regard with your operation and elsewhere as you see it in the US and how do you see what, what initiatives need to be uh, taken to uh, move away from this sort of short-term paradigm? Right, very early, that's a good question, uh, thank you. Very early on, I took my entire board, we spent most of a board meeting, believe it or not, a quarterly board meeting, with me taking them through uh, a book written by Dana Meadows, Beyond the Limits, perhaps you would know that book. There were two books written 20 years apart, The Limits of Growth, 20 years later, Beyond the Limits. And uh, Dana Meadows and Dennis Meadows' computerized projections of future trends are frightening. And I took our entire board through that book, and through, especially through those trends as they unfolded in the book. And I had some skeptics 
but but I also had some people who got it very quickly. And then in 1997, we decided to do a worldwide sales meeting and bring our sales forces from around the world to come together in one place. And we had a thousand people, including a number of suppliers and a few people from the factory floor together. And I took we took our board to this meeting in Hawaii, in Maui. And we committed the entire week to uh, sustainability with the Hawaiian culture as a backdrop. And it was a powerfully uh, effective way of, of, of introducing the results, of the, the consequences of, of, uh, of overshoot as we've got in the Hawaiian islands today. And, and our pe our, all of our people, it was a transformative experience for everybody and the, even the board of directors. And that was the time when we introduced this sustainability report, this 19-page document. And at the end of the, of the week, our board says, you know, we don't see anything about us in here. We would like to write a letter and have it included in, somehow in your report that we endorse and support what you're doing, and which we did. We reissued the report, and there's a letter in there of the board uh, supporting the initiative. All, I say all of that to say that we've been able to get our board to focus on the long term. Uh, and we have the, the same pressures for the quarterly returns, but we've also been able to, to, uh, to persuade them that we really have to look longer term, that this is, in fact, uh, you know, a 20-year project. And, you know, there are three kinds of companies. There are three, I'm sorry, let me say, there are three kinds of CEOs. There are the CEOs that founded their company, there are the CEOs that inherited that company, and there are the CEOs who are hired to run the companies. Three basic types. And the time horizon of the third type is really very, very short. So what I think we will see happen is this move to sustainability, uh, the pay people taking the longer term view will happen more in companies that are run by founders and inheritors. And in time, as the better examples emerge, it will be a compelling example that even the toughest-minded, short-term you know, thinking CEO and board will have to embrace. That's the way I, I hope, hope to see it unfold. Excellent. Perhaps uh, we had some questions over here. I think I might. Oh, there yes, we go. There you Thanks. Go. Uh, Linda Fennell Milner. Um, look, thanks so much, especially for the metaphor in regard to Katrina. Um, I was actually at a, um, a speaking engagement with business last week where an American claimed that the only problem with Katrina was the failure of emergency services. So I'm very glad to see that, um, that people do realise that you know, that's an outcome, that's part of the outcome, it's, it's not the problem. Um, They're I'm, not so blind as those who will not see. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in where is the rest of America? I mean, uh, I'm inspired by what you have said, yet so much of America does not seem to understand this. I know you have Ceres and, um, and other bodies like Ceres who actually are very much promoting um, sustainability, but maybe you can give us some insight into where are your competitors and how do they see right. you? Right. That's a wonderful question. America, American industry is just beginning to get it. Uh, when you see General Electric, Jeffrey M. L. commit General Electric, one of the world's largest corporations, to doubling its R&D budget for clean technologies and with the expectation of doubling its revenues from $5 billion to $10 billion in just a few years in clean technologies, you know that he's not doing that out of altruism. He's doing it in response to his marketplace. So the power is with the people, always has been with the people. And, and the power of the marketplace, the power of the voting booth. And the people of, of the United States are gradually waking up. They're, Deepak Chopra, I don't know whether you know this man, but he's very popular in the United States, uh, says people are really doing the best they can given their level of awareness. This is all about raising levels of awareness. And there's always a high level of awareness for any of us. That this level of awareness is creeping up in the United States on the part of the general population. I mean, people just see that we're pushing nature too far, and they're waking up to that. Paul Hawking, by the way, the author of the book I mentioned, The Ecology of Commerce, 
is doing a new book right now. The title of which he says will be Blessed Unrest. Blessed Unrest. And in researching his book, he is surveying the global environmental and social equity movement, identifying organizations, NGO, nonprofit organizations around the world who are engaged in the environmental or social movement. And the last time I talked to him, which was a couple of months ago, his count had now gone beyond one million. He thinks there may be as many as two million organizations with hundreds of millions of people who are engaged in this endeavor every day as a vocation, not an avocation, but as a vocation. That is huge. And as that movement continues, as the movement continues to grow, it will become a force that cannot be denied by, by business and industry. I suspect it's not too different in Australia. The people lead, and the marketplace demands will, will shape the way business develops. There has to be the development of the, on the supply side as well. And we've been very fortunate in the face to find ourselves in a narrow market segment that really and truly cares. Interior designers, architects that heavily influence our marketplace really want to do the right thing. And they've embraced interface. And it's enabled us to be this sort of microcosm example. And that is, it is a microcosm of something that's happening on a much larger scale. In the United States, the green building movement is exploding. I spoke to that, uh, that group of people at their annual conference in 1995, 10 years ago. I counted the audience. There were 135 people there. This year in Atlanta, more than 10,000, more, excuse me, more than 12,000 people came to the same conference. 135, 12,000. That's in a 10-year period of time. That's explosive growth. And you've got your own counterpart to that developing in Australia. I know the, the, your own Green Building Council. So there's another larger microcosm, if you will. That's an example, I think, of what's happening on a larger scale around the world. Thank you for that. OK, perhaps we've got one more question. One more question, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, OK, I'm getting a signal over here. OK, fine. fine. Uh, thank you, Ray, for your time today. Uh, you mentioned the challenge for education and technology, and I'm interested in the loop as you progress forward. How is Interface working with technology and education to um, evolve the future, if you like? Well, it, right here in Atlanta, where we're headquartered, we have this wonderful technological university called Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology. And we're working very, very closely with them, not just to learn from them, but to influence them and to, and to help them find their way. And one of the things that we have done uh, as Interface is, is, is uh, endow a chair in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering, which was my school at Georgia Tech 50 years ago, the, school of, the, excuse me, the Chair of Natural Systems. Well, when we created that and endowed it and told the university this is what we wanted to do, nobody understood what we were talking about. There was no such thing in existence, I guess, anywhere in the, in the academic world, a chair of natural systems. And my charge to the head of the department was teach me how a forest works. And when I understand how a forest works, I will know what the industrial system of the next industrial revolution must look like with all of those symbiotic relationships. Well, they finally filled the chair. It took them six or seven years to find the right person to fill the chair. But the chair is now filled, and, and they're working away. And in the meantime, Georgia Tech has become a force in this field. And I would invite you to go to their website and see what's going on at Georgia Tech in their Center for Sustainable Technologies. That's an immediate thing. And in a smaller, less, less dramatic way, we're working around the world in areas where we operate to engage local schools, local teachers in, in projects that we help them finance that will sensitize their students to, uh, to sustainability and to the environment. And this is working at the grassroots level. At the same time, we're working at this kind of exalted level with the Georgia Tech. OK. That, thank you, Ray. We have to go now and leave you. I think we could stay and spend probably all morning uh, chatting to you, but uh, you've got to run a business, and uh, we've got uh, to get on with our business here. So, um, it's been a pleasure to be with you.
Thank you. Right, if everyone could say thank you to.